All right. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Hope, yeah, good to see you guys. All right. Who's excited to be here? Woo! I don't know about you, but it's been a good weekend for me. Um, you know, speaking of great weekends, though, can we talk about last weekend? Uh, Matt Light preached. You know, he was just right around here somewhere. He was shared a message with us, closed out our series, Just Do It, and he knocked it out of the park. Uh, Matt brought an amazing word and encouraged us to stick it out. He encouraged us to grow in patience. And I'll never forget one of the things that Matt said. He said it this way. He said, God will never waste your waiting, but you can. And I thought to myself, man, that is so good. It's possible for us to waste our waiting, the time in life where you are waiting between what you hope for and what you're experiencing. And that that time, that gap, we can actually waste that time, but God will not waste your waiting. But do you know who else doesn't waste waiting? You know who else does this? Dogs, right? Like you go out, like if you go leave the house, dogs immediately get after something and get into something, right? Like they're all a mess because you leave the house for a while. They're not waiting. You think they're waiting. You think they're living this, like they made a movie about it. It's called Secret Life of Pets. You can watch it on your own, but it's true. I I don't know if you've ever heard of this website called dogshaming.com. I found what you're going to do the rest of the afternoon if you haven't. Um, See, here's this is where pet owners take pictures of what their dogs have been doing while they're supposedly waiting for their owners to come home, and they're uh, you know they kind of put it in such a funny way, like with a written explanation, like this guy right here. He says, "I'm a bad dog, right? Like I ate the car title two hours before it sold." Right? This guy is eating the title and the, the owners are shaming this dog. Or this one right here. This guy, I don't know how this happens, but I ate a six foot leash and had to have it removed by the vet. Pause. Lots of questions about that. How does that even happen? And like I'd be gagging a little bit into it, but uh, certainly not six feet later. And then uh, three weeks later, I ate a shower curtain. Why? Why? Like, nobody wants that moldy thing in your stomach. Like, or this one, don't even show it yet because this is my favorite. I wasted so much time this week because I was trapped by dogshaming.com and I found my all time favorite because I want to introduce you to Willis. This is my man, Willis. I steal cookies from little kids in strollers and run away. <laughs> Boom! Like, that happened. Henceforth and forevermore, Willis shall be known as the stroller bandit preying on young and innocent kids, right? Like, hide your kids, right? Like, Willis is around. <laughs> but, whew, several years ago, we bought my kids a uh, dog. We brought a dog back into the house. We were young and stupid. And uh, so this is our dog, Cooper. And uh, my kids loved him. Leah loved to push him in a, in a collapsible stroller. I loved to collapse the stroller. Um, but he's this, like, fluffy little thing. And, and uh, Cooper decided that, you know, he wasn't going to wait around for for anybody either. He got into some trouble as well. He helped himself to uh, a couple rolls of toilet paper and just (laughs) tore it up. And also he looks like an Ewok. Like, uh, you know, there's like, this is just teleported in. But um, he, he found out that he liked to tear some stuff up. Now he's thankfully grown out of that. Uh, unless he's doing that at home right now as I'm talking, which is a possibility. But early on in Cooper's, uh, in his history with our family, he had to go and get a surgery. He had to get tutored. And, uh, you know, he, he went off to the vet and, and the vet said, hey, listen, you know, we've got to keep this dog from opening the wounds, scratching, itching, all that kind of thing. And so what do they do is they provide you with one of these, the, the cone of shame. Can we just talk about this for a hot second? And this is out in our yard at the time, like just a couple days afterwards, he's literally, if he could speak right now, he'd be like, I hate you. 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 And then the next thing he would be saying is, don't let anybody see. Don't let anybody see. Hide me, right? Like, hide me. This thing, like, poor Cooper, he was like, we had steps up to our, our deck that would get into our house, and he was, like, hitting the, the next step. I couldn't get it. You had to pick him up and bring him in. And then he'd get in the house, and he'd run into the refrigerator and get stuck. Like, you know, he'd have to do one of these numbers and, like, bring himself way back around. Because this is, this is what you and I know to be true, that dogs wear the cone of shame, you know, many, many different times and reasons and all that stuff. But if we're honest, my freshman year, this, this was basically, this was mine as well. My freshman year in college, I went to a school called Houghton College in upstate New York and small liberal arts Christian college, and it was a dream of mine to go to this school. In fact, my high school best friend, he and I decided that we'd go and be, we'd be roommates, we'd go to school, go to college together, and uh, we thought it just couldn't get any better, except it did. Like, it got a lot better. Like, we, uh, we started playing intramural sports. 
uh, we started, uh, we joined the rock climbing club. We were in the paddle sports club. You know, we would go kayaking, whitewater kayaking, all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, we, we did everything. I even had my own radio show. That's, haha, Matt, I, I won. Um, but like I had my own radio show before podcasting, right? Like I did this whole thing. And, and my freshman year, it took a hard turn though from academics to experiences. And we made memories, but not necessarily grades, right? And so um, the January, when, when grades came out, we all had our mailboxes, like every college and university in the world does, and our grades were delivered in the mailbox, and I thought, okay, like, good, I'm glad they came here and not home, um, because I, like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't doing well. In fact, I failed all of my classes except for two, and I had a D in one and a C in the other. Well, what I didn't know is that Houghton College, in their wisdom, decided that they would not only deliver a paper copy to me, but also one to the house that you are registered at, where your parents live. And so they sent uh, my report card home, and uh, you know, feeling like I was in third grade all over again, I just quickly found out that I wasn't the only one in the loop about my Fs, D, and one solid C. And so a, a day in January, I walk into my dorm, uh, having come back from dinner, and I open the door, and who do I see in my room other than my dad? Now listen, this is a six-hour trip from home. Like, I was six hours away from where I was living, and uh, these types of trips, you know, you didn't make them casually. And I walk in, I'm like, totally shocked. Dad, what are, what are you doing here? He said, I think you need to sit down. And in that moment, I said, oh. Like, it's the kind of moment that you're like, I know where this is going. And immediately, I knew this wasn't going to be good for me. And quite honestly, we went line by line, grade by grade, and he asked me what was going on. He said, you know, what happened here? What happened there? I had to explain my decisions, my behaviors, and my actions, and it was embarrassing. Quite honestly, it was hard. And not that he put this on me, but I felt, I felt so filled with shame for what I had experienced. And so for me, I mean, it was as real as, as putting this thing on right here, you know, like tying it up. I felt like I literally was walking around being like, hey, it's me. Like, don't look over here. Nothing to see here, folks, right? And, and here's the thing. Here's what I know to be true is that some of you walked into the room today and you got this on. Because shame, it shows up in a bunch of different ways. Their sources of shame are, are, are this. It's, some people are ashamed of where you came from. Like, my wife is ashamed of me right now that I have this cone on my head. <laughs> She's like, I don't, I don't know that guy. But, see, so we walked in, and you're like trying to get it off. You're clawing at it. You're pushing at it. And, and here's the deal. We're, we've set this whole series up to help you get rid of this, to help you eliminate shame, to shift shame off of you. And your source of shame may be different than others. Maybe some of you, it's where you came from. Maybe for some of you, it's actually what you're doing, what you're currently doing. Like you would say, oh, I was ashamed of my, my family heritage. I was ashamed of the town I came from, the city I came from, the education I came from. Or maybe you're just ashamed of what you're currently doing. You're ashamed of your parenting. You're ashamed of your marriage. You're ashamed of your career. You're ashamed of your behaviors, your actions, all kinds of things. Or maybe you're just ashamed of who you are. That this cone, if it were to be labeled, you would just say, I don't, I don't like who I am. Like, I don't know that I actually like me. See, shame squashes your gifts, it stifles your strengths, and it pushes you down and it prevents you from being the most fully you. Because when you try and avoid being you in order to be somebody else, you're missing out on who God created you to be. This is why this is so important. And I need you to understand something. Baseline understanding is that Shame never comes from God. Never. Shame is, it never comes from God. In fact, in our series, we're going to discover how to shift shame and find freedom in Jesus. And we want to help you move beyond that shame so that you can easily get a hold of, of the life that God has planned for you. In the very beginning, in the very beginning of the story, of God's story, we find that shame is actually taking root in the story of humanity very early on. That five-letter, uh, very pervasive little word began to pop up right in the midst of, catch this, 
imperfection. In the midst of where everything was perfect, um, shame starts popping up. And so I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter three. Uh, if you've ever like decided, you're like, I wanna turn in the Bible, but I'm afraid to find it, this is a perfect one for you. It's page two. You can do it. Everybody can do it, okay? Um, or you can click over in your version app, and we have our notes there digitally. You can track along with us. Um, your bottom right corner, click that little uh, hamburger button, and then it's gonna continue to walk you through these next three steps to find um, this event, Hope City Church. You can take notes, share those notes, save those notes, all that stuff. But while you're turning there, I want you to understand how good everything was in the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 through 28, God has created the heavens, he's created the earth, he's created everything that is in it, everything that has life, everything that has breath, it's already created. He created the sky, the sea, the solar system, all that stuff. And then we find God stepping in in Genesis 1, verse 27. He says, God created man, catch this, in his own image. So everything else was created you know, in, unto itself, but God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living creature that moves on the ground. God saw mankind and he was pleased with it. God was like, this, I can get behind this. God blessed it. And in Genesis 2, we see the story of the genders coming out, right? Man being formed, women being formed, and then them coming together and catch this, mutual support of one another, okay? Neither being superior to the other. They were there to help and to serve one another. And then comes this verse that, like, I like to quote it, um, and it's every groom's, like, dream, right? He says this, Genesis 2, verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And everybody's like, woo, right? Like, this is, this is in the Bible? Like, yeah, page two, okay? Like, in the beginning, they were naked. <laughs> and you're like, can we get back to perfection later? Uh, so here's the reality. This is what we like to talk about. The man and his wife were both naked. We get pumped about that. The beginning, they were just running around naked. It was like a nudist colony, right? But listen to the important part. That's not the important part. This is just a whole bunch of, like, yeah, this is, so this is the important part. They felt no shame. They're in the midst of perfection. And they feel no shame. From the beginning, it was God's intention that you would not feel shame. You would not have to wander around with a cone of shame on your neck. And this is what Adam and Eve were living in for a hot second. This perfect state of humanity was actually ruined by, uh, by this one word, the Hebrew word called ba'ush, which means utterly dejected. We've translated ba'ush to being shame, but they were utterly dejected. I don't know if you've ever been utterly dejected by somebody, or you've felt utterly dejected, but that's what stepped in. That's what broke perfection, and that's what breaks your heart. Can you imagine how freeing life would be if there was nothing to cause you to feel shame? Sadly, this condition didn't last long, though. Adam and Eve, they, uh, they stepped into chapter three, and so three chapters in, and we're dealing with this five-letter word, shame. And it says this in verse one, but now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Is that what God really said? The woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you'll die. You surely won't die. You know, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Here we find that one of Satan's oldest tricks in the book is this, Satan being your spiritual enemy, my spiritual enemy. One of his oldest tricks is to cause you to question God. God, why did you make me like this? God, why did you put me in that family? I don't even like my family. God, why, why did you uh, give me these skills? I don't want these skills. Like, I'm not, I don't want to be uh, you know, kind of the one that pulls everything together. I don't want to be that person. Why can't I just be a little bit more timid, a little bit more go with the flow? God, why? See, was God really being good to you? God, are you, do you actually like me? 
See, that's what Satan wants to whisper in your ears to get you to doubt God and doubt his calling on your life and doubt his goodness in your life and to cause you to turn your back to God. And then what does Eve do? She falls for it. She does exactly what Satan had hoped. It says that when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. Then the eyes... The eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So in this moment, all of a sudden, they're now able to see. They're seeing what's happening around them, and they're opened to what's going on in them. See, sin causes you to take your eyes off of the goodness of God and put it onto yourself. Sin is saying, shift your attention and focus it on yourself, your needs, your wants, your desires, all of that stuff. And their eyes were drawn to their own shame. And it was all that they could see. See, this is what makes shame so powerful. Because if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Shame fights for your identity. Shame fights for your identity. Shame fights to say, you are this. This is who you are. This cone of shame, this defines you. This is your reality. This is your, your life. This is all that you will ever be. Shame takes root in your life and it says, this is who you are now. You are naked and you're alone or you are your last mistake or you're your greatest mistake. Several years ago, I was a campus pastor and uh, one of the guys that came to my campus, to my church, uh, he, he would frequently ask me to go to coffee. I love coffee and I love meeting people for coffee. And this guy, Joe, he would sit down and he would, he would ask me all the time, hey, I just don't know how God could love me. And finally, after like the fourth time, I'm like, listen, we have been around this horn. What is it really? What is it really? Like, what's the story behind the story? And he proceeded to tell me that when he was like a 20-something-year-old man, that he got his girlfriend pregnant, and he convinced his girlfriend to get an abortion. And from that moment forward, he could never forgive himself. That he was haunted and plagued by something that he had done 40 years ago. He went on to tell me how it was like, and he's, he's happily married, been happily married for like 30 something years to just a saint of a woman. And but he still is defining his present by what he did 40 years ago. See, shame wants you to do that. Shame fights for your identity. Shame is saying, you are not who you think you are. You're actually, you know, what I want to remind you of what you've done. Shame is, is incredibly powerful. Shame wants you to believe that you didn't only do bad, but you actually are bad. In fact, guilt, guilt is a very positive thing. It's very, it can be helpful. Guilt says you did bad. Shame says you are bad. Like, it just says you're a bad person. In other words, guilt is about the who, the do, and shame is about the who. Guilt is, this is what you do. Shame says, this is who you are. And listen to what the Bible says, though. This is what the Bible says about your and my do. This is Romans 3, 23. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is our do. Every single one of us. There is not a person in this room who hasn't done something, who isn't, isn't living in some sort of do that isn't necessarily perfect, right? It isn't, we all experience this. But listen to what God says about who you are. In Psalm 139, verse 14, he says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. God says, this is who you are. You are a chosen daughter of God. You are a chosen son of God. You are a, a son of God that has purpose and meaning and value, right? Like we tell the women at sisterhood that they are loved, chosen, and cherished, and this is who God sees them as. And yet some of us run around, we're saying, no, 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 I am actually this. And we struggle with this or that. And God's saying, no, no, you got to get rid of that because this is what, what I see you as. Look at what Adam and Eve did next. So they see their eyes are open, they see their shame, they see their nakedness, and they sew fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and the woman, the wife, heard the sound of the Lord coming um, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God. They hid from God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man, hey, where are you? Yo, Adam, Eve. And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid 
because I was naked, so I hid. See, shame sets in, and, and what is the first thing that Adam and Eve do? They cover it. They cover over their shame. They try and sew some fig leaves together to, to cover their bodies so that they're not naked anymore. And, and what do you do when the first thing that you, shame rolls into your life, what do you do? You, you cover it. You hide it, right? Like you don't go posting it on, on Facebook and Instagram. You're like, hey, look at how much of a failure I am. Click, right? Like, no, nobody does that. We hide it. But listen to me. Covering shame increases shame. When you cover your shame, it increases shame. You can't hide your way out of shame. You can't, you know, hide shame out of existence. Shame grows in the dark. It's like that toxic mold that you don't even know it's there, but it's kind of just pervasively growing, creeping throughout your walls and all this stuff growing in the dark. You guys remember my freshman year in college? Remember how my dad sat me down in my room and asked me what's going on? Well, before he drove back home six hours with my mom back to Westchester, Pennsylvania, where we were living, uh, he said to me, Peter, I want you to know something. If you keep this up, and if your grades do not drastically change, if they remain the way that they are, you will not be returning here next year. My dream, right? All of these good things that you see, all these good things that you're a part of, like, Honestly, like, if, if any of you are wondering, like, if I'm leaving parts of the story out, was I drinking? Like, no, none of that stuff. We just were playing a lot of sports. We were playing a lot of, like, PlayStation, I think it was one. <laughs> <laughs> like, we were doing a lot of social stuff. He said, if all that doesn't change, all this good stuff that you have, you won't be returning here. You know when your dad means it? He meant it. I knew he meant it. I heard my dad's Volkswagen Vanagon leave the, the parking lot, and um, I, was, I could tell, you know, as it went further away that, you know, they were further away. And for the next, you know, that next semester, I wish I could tell you that I, I told my friends about that conversation. I wish I could tell you that I told them about my grades. I wish I could tell you that I worked with professors. I wish I could tell you that I got tutoring. I wish that I could tell you that I you know, dropped out of some of the clubs, maybe not all of them, but some of them. And I wish I could tell you that my grades went up, but they didn't. In fact, I completed my second semester with four, no, three Ds, uh, excuse me, three Fs, one D, and one C. I never told anybody. I never told my parents. I let the letter do that. So that came back. It's on academic probation. And my parents said, sorry, you're not going back. I knew that. But yet I continued to act like I was. We made plans like I was. I picked out my roommate, Brian Glennie. We were in a room together my sophomore year at Houghton College. We high-fived, we picked out our room, we knew everything. I knew full well I wasn't returning. I talked to my current roommate and we talked about, we made plans for the next fall. I, I was dating this girl at the time, told nobody that I wouldn't be returning until I came home and all summer long, I still told nobody. In fact, the only way that they found out that I wasn't coming back was because Brian Glennie didn't have a roommate. I was filled with so much shame in who I was. And my shame was growing by the minute. It was growing by the day. It was growing by the month and the week. An entire summer went by having told nobody, and everyone thought that I was coming back to school. But hiding what I hiding my shame, hiding my thoughts, my feelings, and my reality. Here's what happened. It caused me to lose some of my best friends. It caused me to lose some of my greatest experiences. It caused me to, to miss out on some good things. And even more than that, and I probably don't even know that I realized it until I was writing this message, I ran around with the cone of shame on my head, on my neck, for another dozen years. Because what I told myself is that you're not smart, 
you won't be very good, and I don't think you can do it. I, I graduated college. I went to change schools, met my wife. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me. I made it through, but I still believed that I wasn't capable. It wouldn't be until nine years after graduating college that I would go back for my master's degree in seminary that I would realize that this, it didn't define me any longer. In fact, I found out that I was an excellent student, that I, I wasn't actually just defined as a near college dropout, that I could excel at something, that I could put thoughts together in, in a way that was meaningful and helpful. See, you'll never heal what you won't reveal. You'll, you'll never move beyond this, this shackle that, that is just clinging to you if you don't actually reveal it. Shame is like, ha, I got you. I know who you are. I'm defining you. And, and the Bible tells us that, no, 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 no. God defines us. God tells us who we are. See, that, that secret that you're holding on to, it's toxic for your soul. And Satan would love nothing more than to keep you isolated and to keep you fighting for your identity. Because if you're going to shift your shame, you're going to have to bring guilt into the light. This is why confession is so important. Confession is when we go to God for forgiveness, but we go to one another for healing. So we go to the person that we may have offended, hurt, or um, you know, you know, bothered, and we say, hey, I'm so sorry. I confess that I did that. And then we go to God for forgiveness. But when your due doesn't line up with God's plan for your life, when we sin, we need to go into God for forgiveness. And so the question I have is like, hey, you know, what are some things that you need to confess and ask God um, forgiveness from today? Maybe you need to have a conversation with somebody and you need to say, I just, I need to get this shame off of me. I can't carry this around with me any longer. See, we've got to get serious about shifting shame because there's no greater picture of hope than the one that we're about to see. And here we find Adam and Eve, they're hiding behind fig leaves, right? They're trying to cover their naked bodies. They're running from, from shrub to shrub. And God steps in and he says, enough with this. Enough with this hiding. Like, can we put this beside us? We're not doing this any longer. You know, enough trying to cover yourself. And look at what God does. In Genesis 3.21, he says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Right here, we see two very important things. One is that God refused to allow Adam and Eve to continue living a life of shame. God's love for them was too great to allow them to wander around and you know, hide. God clothed them. The second thing is, how did he do this? In order for God to clothe Adam and Eve, he took the garments or the, the skin from an animal, and God sacrificed the life of one thing in order to, um, to bless the lives of another so that something good would come out of something very tragic. God was the first to move towards Adam and Eve, and God was the one who took matters into his own hands. God refused to allow them to stay stuck in their history of decisions, and he made a way forward. Because history doesn't determine your destiny. That's what shame says. Shame says, oh, but listen, you were this. You are a product of divorce. You are a, a product of failure. You are addicted. You are filled with shame, and you can't possibly ever move forward. You may, you may have made horrible decisions. You might have done it this morning. You may have hurt the people around you that you love the very most, and you can't possibly believe that. Like You're like, I can't believe I did that. And you're filled with shame. But your shame doesn't identify you. Your shame doesn't make you up. And, and listen, your history, the things that you've done, it does not determine your destiny. See, where you are today is not where God wants you tomorrow. Let me tell you about a, a little kid by the name of Ryan Kioti who gets it. Ryan uh, is a third grade student in California. And he went to school day after day, like every other kid in the world. And he saw some of his classmates who were no longer able to get lunch in the same way that he was. And so he started talking about it with them, and one of his peers, he stepped into the lunch line on, on that kid's birthday, and instead of getting a hot lunch like everyone else, like Ryan had, he got an alternative lunch, and it was consisted of bread and cheese. And this little nine-year-old's mind, he knew that wasn't right, and he found out that there were some of his kids in his class who couldn't afford lunch, and actually they were, had worked up a school lunch debt that prevented them from experiencing the goodness, the, 
decentness of everything else that the other kids were enjoying, right? So Ryan scrapped together all of the money that he had, his, his uh, allowance and all this money that he had been given. And uh, it's a news story. Like, you can go check this out. This, this kid is amazing. He came in the next day with $74.80, paid off his, his peers' um, lunch debt so that, <laughs> so that they could enjoy the goodness of the things that he was enjoying. He covered their bill. Their history was a negative balance, and yet, because of his actions, he changed their future. Where they were was not where they wanted to be. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to cover that for you. And this is exactly what God has done for you and for me. God covered your negative balance. He covered your sin. He covered the times when you're, you're, you're turning your back to him. You made the wrong choice. You're living in sin. And he saw that your history, what you've done, and he says, I see how it's plaguing you with guilt, the shame, the do, and the who, right? And God said, this can't go on any longer. And so just like that, in the Garden of Eden, one day God, in the future, he would sacrifice again. The Garden of Eden, he sacrificed an animal, he clothed Adam and Eve, and then one day, some like, you know, 3,000, 4,000 years later, he sent his son Jesus to earth because he would do the very same thing all over again. He would sacrifice one thing on the behalf of the many things. And Jesus, in turn, was that sacrifice. He went and hung on a cross to die for you and for me, for our sins. Because why? He wanted to pay the debt that you and I owed. That we, that we had been holding on to. He wanted to cover over the shame that we've been living with. And he's like, no, no, we're going to get that out of here. Like, you, enough is enough. We're not running around with shame anymore. You're not identified by shame. And this morning, I want to encourage you to shift shame by shifting your focus. Because it's easy to stay stuck on what you've done or what you should have done or what you could have done. It's easy to listen to the, the whispers of the lie of, of, about who Satan says you are. This morning, I was supposed to have some friends who are other church planters from Michigan. They were in town for a wedding and they were like, oh, we're going to swing by and we're going to come and visit your church. And and uh, I got to tell you that there was a part of me that was happy, but then also a part of me that was like, oh no. What are you going to think of me when you show up? Because I wish I could tell you that there's a moment when you get over shame and it's just done. But Satan whispers the lies. And that lie that I hear in my head from time to time is this you're really not as smart as you think you are. Remember that you were almost a college dropout? Remember that? And I know that there are churches that you can go to, and that guy knows the Bible inside and out, and he can quote it in Hebrew and, and, and Greek, and he can tell you all this stuff, and that's not me. And if I'm not careful... I can begin to allow that whisper, that lie of like, you're not good enough because you almost dropped out of college and because you almost, you barely, you limped through your college graduation. You did okay in your master's, but that was, oof. And I got to say, no, 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 that's not who I am. This is who God made me to be. And I'm going to walk in that. See, listen to me. No one else, nobody else in this world was able to give my kids their name other than Tiffany and I. Why? We made them. <laughs> They're ours. We looked at them and we said, you're Noah Thomas. You're Grace Madison. You're Leah Kate. You are mine. I love you. You are chosen. And there's nothing that you can do that will ever, 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 ever separate us and you. We'll never stop loving you. God placed them in our care. And, and the same thing is true, that God made you. What do we see in the very beginning? That God created mankind. He created men and women in his image. And he said, it's good. It's good. And yet a lot of us are running around listening to the whisper of, ah, I'm so bad. And God said, no, you're good. 
In fact, part of the, the imagery in this series is, is the idea that God stepped down to touch humanity, that God broke through in the Garden of Eden. In the beauty of all that, we find ourselves in imperfection, in this black and white world, and God said, no, I created you to live in this, this incredible place, this place of perfection, this place of beauty. And when we broke it, God said, I'm going to heal it. And God, in his amazing wisdom, he reached down so that you and I could get shame off us. We could shift shame and we could drop the cone of shame and live the life that he's intended for you. See, I don't know the voices that you're listening to. I don't know the things that you're tempted to believe about yourself, but here's what what God says about you. Your maker, your heavenly father says that when you feel dead inside, that you're alive with Christ. That's what Ephesians says. When you feel like you're just your same old self and nothing ever changes, 2 Corinthians says that you're a new creation. When you say that I can never get it right, all I do is ever mess up, guess what? The Bible tells you that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you think it's too much, 1 John tells us that greater is he who is in the world than he who is, uh, he who is in me than he who is in the world. When you don't think that anyone could possibly love you, guess what? I'm greatly loved by God. In Romans, in Ephesians, and Colossians, you're greatly loved. When you're tempted to believe that you can't do it anymore, Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And when you wonder if you have a purpose, Ephesians says, I am God's workmanship created for good works. And when you want to give up and you want to hang your head in shame, Romans says, I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. This morning, we want to help you shift shame. We want to help you get shame off of you. In fact, we put uh, some cards together. These, we, we've printed them. I don't, I don't care how much it costs. We were going to do this because I want you to know and be reminded of who you are in Jesus, who God says you are your creator, your father, your maker. He says this about you. And so on your way out, uh, some friends of mine are going to be handing these out. Everybody gets one today. I want them in your car, in your wallet, in your mirror, wherever you need this. Be reminded of who God sees you as because we're going to shift shame by shifting your focus. We're going to take our eyes off of the things that, that maybe are distracting us and we're going to keep our eyes on what Jesus says about us. See, what if today you could focus on on more of what God says about you than what Satan says? Because one is an accuser and one is your creator. One is a liar and one is your father who loves you. It's time to get shame off you. What if today, what if today the voice of God said to you, my son, my daughter, the shame is off you.